So we're here uh, primarily uh, to talk about Henry's new book, Occupants, which when I first saw this title, I thought, that is the greatest band name I have never heard of before. <laughs> Why nobody's used that name before? I mean, either in a punk rock band, a no wave band, or even like, you know, a, a post wave, uh, new wave goth band. I don't know. It's a great name, so that's the first thing that struck me. Uh, I haven't really, um, you know, I've been sort of keeping tabs on Rollins through the years. Uh, you know, I, I'm one of his hugest enthusiasts from, uh, from, from since I first heard about him in the uh, early 80s. He was a, uh, Henry, you're 50 this year, right? Yes, sir. I'm 53, but I, I'd always thought Henry was at least 10 years younger than I was. And, uh, I, I think it had to do a lot with moving to New York at 18 years old and being the youngest guy in the room for the longest time and always and i always thought i was always going to be that guy and then all of a sudden there was this these younger guys started happening and they started making bands that were directly inspired by ground zero punk rock which at a time at that time for me i thought that had been decimated Primarily by the death of Sid Vicious, I thought like, okay, now we're gonna move on and go into other territories. But all of a sudden, there's this whole new crew of like young guys and girls in America and subsequently around the world who had their own investigation going on into punk rock and they sort of created their own rules with it, decided to dispense of the buffoonery and the, the fucked upness of it and used it as a, uh, as an alternative for their lifestyle of just sort of like going up against the standards of assholeism. <clears throat> and so a lot of it was really focused on Washington, D.C. At least that's how I saw it. And there was this like this whole crew of guys that I started noticing, such as Henry, Ian Mackay, and other, guy, other dudes. And uh, at first I didn't know what to think of it because I thought like, well, you know, punk rock is passe. What are these guys doing? And then I heard the music and it was so raw and to me really curious but the one thing that really struck me was like how good the songs were like they were really good songs and they were these lyrics were being written by teenagers who were really wearing this kind of emotional angst like on their hearts like just for like the world to see it was ripped open it was, that wasn't what was happening in the scene i was in so much it was like really shrouded in different sort of kind of different sort of, uh, I don't know, artistic kind of um, sort of over-intellectualized kind of concepts of like wordplay and music. This was not that so much. This was just like, we're going to cut you and we're going to see, see what happens. Oh. That's it. That's it. That's it. Is it just yours? Yeah, so far. Right, we got to there. Yeah, I'll use Henry's for the time being. We'll pass this back and forth. This has a better EQ anyway. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get too long-winded because I will do that, and I want to sort of make sure Henry sort of talks about this book. Uh, but be that as it may, I I, uh, I was very interested in what was going on with this with this guy who I thought was 10 years younger than I, and I finally met him through a mutual friend of ours, uh, this woman, Lydia Lunch, who I had been playing music with, and she started sort of doing work with Henry, and I met this guy, and I didn't know what to think of him. You know, he, he seemed really super guarded. I did not, uh, I did not know that he, I couldn't figure out, I, I couldn't figure this guy out, and I realized that he didn't really, really need or want me or anybody to actually know what he was up to anyway and that was that created this mystery and i was always very intrigued by this dude and <clears throat> you know and his his um his performance as a lead singer was mind-blowing and i saw it immediately as being in the lineage of like really good lead singers, like really good musicians on stage, you know, from Iggy Pop to Joey Ramone, guys who struck a figure on stage and it was distinct and it was them and it was real. And so I really was very, very uh, enthused by this guy's work and especially in the context of Black Flag, which is the band he joined after his initial hardcore band, SOA in uh, DC. Which I was very curious about. You don't really mention SOA in your author's uh, notes. You mentioned that you joined Black Flag. 
Uh, well, uh, in those days in Washington, D.C., many of us youth were in bands. And I was so overwhelmed by a band called Minor Threat that was headed up by my friend Ian Mackay and coming from the same town as the Bad Brains. All of us, the, in, our, us mere mortals and all the other bands, realized who the bosses were in town. It was Minor Threat and the Bad Brains. And so my dubious musical history before Black Flag, I... Weren't you in the, I'm like, yeah, I was, kind of. Well, maybe there'll be a PA here. Anyway. Um, you guys can hear us anyway, right? Yeah. We don't need this, do we? Loud mouth. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that was the musical history for me, where we had 30 second songs. The set length was about 11 minutes. Most of it was the band yelling, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And then we would just destroy some small, poorly written song we had written. Then Minor Threat would go on stage and you could hear every lyric. They played with such precision, you knew every word. And so those days to me, I was more the fan who got to be in a band for a minute. And so that's why I rarely mention that band, just because. But that band is a great band. They have one record out and they also have on a compilation or two. And you know, when I talk about the songwriting that was going on with that, the, the, that genre of bands, Henry's band was as good as it got, as far as I was concerned. I mean, Minor Threat were great, Void were great, The Faith were great, Government Issue were great. All these bands were really, really good in songwriting. And what impressed me with SOA is like they had their own sound. And all those songs on, if you ever get that SOA EP, listen to it. I mean, it's, it's fucking great punk rock songwriting. I, I'm like a huge ass record collector, as is Henry. And I've gone through years and years of amassing, you know, tons of records and I go through these years where I get rid of so much but I never touch those because those to me are really significant records I think in like American Underground. Yeah, <laughs> Ian's label Discord, he made really essential listening and uh, growing up in that scene, it was a DIY scene in those days you would have a, a glue stick party, everyone would bring a Yoohoo glue stick, you'd go to someone's house and cut out Discord sleeves, fold and glue them and insert the record. So if you have the original pressings of Discord 7 inches, those are handmade by myself, people in bands, everyone's friends, you'd all kind of just sit in someone's living room until the early hours just cutting and gluing and you got like a record as pay. And uh, so those records are basically hand rolled. And uh, <laughs> it, it gave me a very DIY ethic because I watched Ian build this label up from the ground and now it's a very established independent label. I went from there to Black Flag, which again was SST Records, another independent label that was putting out bands like the Minutemen and the Stains and Sacred Trust and later the Meat Puppets and Husker Du, and eventually uh, Sonic Youth and the Bad Brains and Soundgarden. But in those early days, it was like three or four bands. Everyone was starting, and we did everything ourselves from laying out the records, laying out the flyers. And a lot of bands did. Uh, Thurston was laying out his records, you're recording the records yourself, you don't have much help, you're innovating because there's no one there to help you, you have no cushion because you have no major label signing, everything is, you have to be smart because if you're not smart and innovative, you will not have a band or a record in a year because you'll just be eaten up by the eventualities of uh, not selling enough records. So, uh, both of us have been in this world of DIY, jumping in and out of the major label world and the corporate world, but maintaining the art. Uh, I started a, a publishing company in 1983, uh, spurred on by the fact that I was living on the road and like many independent bands in those days, getting America in the teeth. You'd go and play in some pretty tough parts of towns all over America. Law enforcement was not always friendly and uh, bouncers were not always friendly. Promoters and agents were often quite dishonest. And so you had a tale to tell. And with my meager earnings, I would buy notebooks at the drugstore and fill them with what I would see. And in 1982 or so, I thought I, I would, uh, I'd, I'll start a book company, that's what I'll do. And knowing that no one would read my, my handwritten folded chapbooks, I went bravely on, inspired by Henry Miller and people like that, and just the DIY ethic. Thirty years later, I have a, a staff, an office, a publishing company, and the latest book I did is this one that some of you have, that, that Thurston is sitting with. Um, it's the first photo book I've ever done. And I, rock and roll will get you pretty far and wide. If you like to travel, you can be broke and well-traveled if you're in a band. Like, you'll meet poor musicians who have seen Japan, Australia, uh, Eastern Europe. You know, they have crazy stories, because rock and roll will get you pretty far and wide. In the 90s, 
or somewhere in the 90s, people would say, you guys travel a lot. And I said, yeah, but I've never been to Africa. And that was always like my well. And I thought to myself, well, why, why can't, why is that the sticking point? I should get to Africa. And so I made a rule for myself. I'm going to go to Africa once a year, if I can, and see how that works. I'm just going to travel for the hell of it. And so uh, months later, I find myself being roundly teased by uh, Maasai tribesmen who thought my tattoos were hilarious. <laughs> so they were standing four feet above me, looking at me, like grabbing my arm like it belongs to someone else, like bringing their friends over. And I'm standing on a, a landing strip in uh, uh, Kichwa Tembo uh, in, in, on the Tanzanian border, getting laughed at it. They're holding my arm up. These are basketball player-sized men, incredibly amazing. And, and I said, okay, this will do. I'm going to do this very often. And that's when I started bringing a camera uh, to take photos of what I would see. And us, us guys are wont to do, over the years, you must up the gear. Because men in gear, that's quite a thing, as you women are, you, you're so well aware, we always have to get more gear. It's compensating for something. And um, as the years went on, I did more and more travel. And the, my points of destination was never a vacation, was my idea. And I was one of the one of the custodians of the Bush administration, in that he wasted my time and killed my fellow Americans and Iraqis and people all over the world for eight solid years. And I would follow behind him, cleaning up the blood and guts and the tears by being a member of the USO, which I got a lot of heat for. Like, if you don't like war, why you met, why you hang out with soldiers? Well, because Congress starts wars, not soldiers. They're sent in to do the bidding. And so I'd go to Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Kuwait, and I'd see all manner of, of things. I'd go to Walter Reed, I'd go to Bethesda Medical and see men with no testicles, no brains, no eyes, no whatever. I started bringing a camera to these places, got better gear, and at one point being the DIY boy that I am, and, you know, headstrong. Uh, somewhere in the 90s or in the early part of this century, I said, I know what I'll do. I'll make a photo book. That'll show them. <laughs> and I have written many travel books, because I sleep with the owner of the record company or the book company every night. That's me. And, uh, and there's no saying no to me, especially when it's me talking to myself. And so anyway, uh, I thought the idea for the book should be, I will go far and wide. I don't like taking photos of landscape, because uh, as Bruce Lee used to say about boards, boards don't hit back. Landscape doesn't hit back. I like to get up close to people, not in a confrontational way. I'm not paparazzi. I'm not trying to inspire a fight. I'm not a tough guy. I'm not looking for trouble. But people interest me. I find Homo sapiens, a species, to be incredibly beautiful. I mean, you go see them all over the world, and I'm not trying to sound like some stupid uh, Richard Kipling type. You know, like, I, I love these, these people from Suriname. I've got five in my backyard. That's not, that's not what I'm after. But, but when you see men and women in, in Senegal, you see the beautiful bone structure of their face, the, the complexity of the skin, the dynamic of the jawline. I want a photo of that. When you see some village elder or some ancient, you know, per elderly person in Tibet and you see the history of the world in that face, or when you run into interesting looking people in Kyrgyzstan, you can see the evidence of Stalin in that a Chinese skull shape, but light eyes and light hair. Ah, that goes back to Stalin arbitrarily placing white people all through Central Asia and breaking these the landmass up arbitrarily into the, all the different stands. This is fascinating to me, and I want a photo. I want to meet these people. And so my, over the years, my, my passport has become thick with visas. Because I just, I leave for about 100 days at a time with my backpack and my other backpack, which is now camera gear. I'm that geared up. It's now like this thing that's ruining my posture. And you know, can't have enough lenses, can't have enough bodies, have to take a photo of everything. And I go on the road in the world for months and months and months, basically walking through every souk village and uh, every slum I can find, sticking my hand out and, and saying hello. And my icebreaker is people say, what are you doing here? And I say, I'm here to meet you, which is true. But it gets a laugh. And I've gotten that laugh in Lebanon, uh, Syria, Pakistan, Iran, not so much in Saudi Arabia, but they're uptight. Um, <laughs> but I try. Well, they're nice, but you know, they're being watched. Uh, and, and, and so the product of this book is portraits of people all over the world. And so I, I started editing the book. And I decided that I would be relegated to that thing I hate where uh, you're just a celebrity with a celebrity photo book. And you know that I'm not a celebrity. I know that I'm not a celebrity. But people who want to put you in the pejorative will regard you as a celebrity. So, and I, since I live in California, I must be a California liberal celebrity 
basically hanging out under the skirts of Barbara Streisand and Hanoi Jane. And, and, and so I didn't want that. I didn't want to be sidelined. And so I started writing pieces that accompany the photos. I look at the photo and I start writing. Sometimes the writing would come out extremely angry because uh, you I like. The man I have no time for. So I'm an angry person. And I looked at some of the, the heaviness of some of the writing. I said, well, I'll put five or ten of these little writing bits in the book, and that'll give it more stick to your ribs, go out in the cold weather and play. And then I said, I'm going to write one for every damn photo in this book, which is what you do sometimes when you're bullheaded. And uh, then I realized the workload I had married myself to, but I, was, I sought to see it through. So the photos in the book are were kind of hard to get in that sometimes America doesn't want you to go to some countries like Pakistan or Iran because they're afraid, especially I think with Iran, that you're going to have a really good time and you're going to come back and blow the, the, the pro let's kill everyone in, in Iran thing that we have been having at least since 1979 or maybe 1953. I went and had a marvelous time, ate the best ice cream I've ever had in my life, saw beautiful women, just amazing looking people, tremendous food, and I walked the streets of Tehran without anyone around me and no uh, uh, aggressiveness was ever put towards me at all. And I came back and said, I had a good time. And since then, I get taken into rooms at international airports like, and they look at my pad, why'd you go here? Because I'm Johnny Quest. Why'd you go here? <laughs> because I'm curious. And they got, and so this, this book is the product of that travel. It's the writing that was the painful part because the writing got all the anger that I have, and the writing was very, very painful. And so the book that some of you will check out tonight is a product of a lot of miles, about seven years of work. But all, for all, the writing was the hardest part. And there's, uh, I, I've never been edited before by a professional. Uh, so I gave this manuscript to this real editor, and he looked at this stuff and didn't quite understand. There's a, a picture of a woman in Thailand in the book who's sweeping up next to a Ronald McDonald statue. And Westernization and globalization of other cultures to me is disgusting. How they just trample culture flat. As Thomas Friedman can kiss my ass. He's a smart guy, but I, I'm not a fan. Because uh, his version of globalization is different than mine. And so I wrote a very angry thing about this woman sweeping up. I basically said, you lost, we won. We destroyed your culture. Screw you. And I'm basically talking in the, in the, uh, as a Koch brother. And I sent this to this guy and he said, why are you being so mean to this woman? I said, no, I said, I'm writing in this case. And how come you're, why'd you, why'd you call Anne Rand that word? Because I, want to, because I want to piss those people off. And it's not a word I'm going to say out loud. And it's not a word I really use. But I wrote it because I, I want to get something going. And so that's the writing, that's the book. And so that's what you saw, and that's, that's what you have in your hand. And so uh, I, the, writing the book and traveling the way I do has made me really like homo sapiens. I like people, because I see their struggle. I have been to Vietnam many times, gone through all parts of it, and you see a country still emerging from the Vietnam War. Kids are still being born with the signs of Agent Orange. That, that's not over, that war's not over. People are still picking up unexploded ordnance in Laos. Uh, kids are still picking up stuff that Kissinger and Nixon dropped on them. And they're like, what's this? Boom! The thing that blows your hand off. Yet they're so gentle and so friendly and so generous when you walk through their villages, through their places. And me, traveling alone with a backpack and a camera, I depend on people's generosity for them not to kill me, for them to give me directions, and sometimes even to feed me. And so far, the only times I've ever had to run for my life have been in America, where I've nearly been killed. But the rest of the world, except for the mortar attack in Baghdad, the rest of the world has been very, very kind to me. And so, while I'm not the, the most outgoing person, I really like people. And the more I travel, and the more I see these beautiful people and their unique struggles and challenges, the more I think homo sapiens are gonna be a very hard species to eradicate, no matter how much people deny global climate change and how much the water gets redirected and bought by Nestle. Uh, I think somehow we will persevere through our, our kindness and our generosity and our sanity. And that's what I'm, the book is basically an anti-war book. I'm trying to close the distance between the great disconnect that some Americans have and the rest of the world, where they think Arabs are, are filthy idiots who scratch in the sand. These are the people who invented 
languages and, and mathematics, so, so they got something going for them. And, and so this book is basically, it's an anti-war statement, it's trying to shorten the gap between you and me and everyone else. And this may sound kind of cloying or tree-hugging or hacky sack kicking or dog uh, patting, but I think you and I are, are the vehicle of great change and betterment in this century, because this is the only century that we have, we're not getting out of it. And I think that you came to this place to hang out with me and Thurston, you must be on some kind of good foot. And so we are that which is going to uh, confront and confound these sons of bitches who are trying to ruin the world. I want the P-Funk Ramones 24-7 block party worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> I want the world to be a Mardi Gras fun ball spinning gently in space so finally the aliens will land. Because they'll hear the bass throngs of Lucy Collins from deep space. And they'll know that we're getting down with it. And so the book is basically the smallest monkey wrench hurled at the biggest, meanest machine on Earth, which is all those complexes and all those people who try and ruin things. And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what it is. I talked a long time, Thurston, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Machine. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, Henry talks about the writing in this book, and the first thing that struck me when uh, his publisher sent me this book, and I flicked through it and I saw the photographs, is uh, I thought next to each photograph was going to be a, a descriptive uh, analysis of, of each photograph. And what it turned out to be was writing that was juxtaposed with the photograph that wasn't necessarily descriptive, but was coming from a sort of a um, a creative mindset um, that was that was thinking about this photograph, remembering where he was at, without having uh, to describe the action of the photograph. And then in the back of the book, there's many's of all the photographs where there's actual captions that do describe exactly what was happening when he took that shot and what he was seeing. Um, so I thought that was really kind of a, a really kind of a wonderful way of laying this book out that Chicago Review Press did. It's not a 21361 thing. Is that still an extant publishing uh, concern for you? Yeah, uh, the reasons why is this, this book is not on my imprint is very simple. It's about six figures to set up a photo book. And my assistant of 14 years, she said, okay, you're gonna do a photo book, I can't stop you. Um, how about we not do it on your, on your label? And I said, why? She goes, like, you really want to let that money hang out? And we can't promote it. We don't, we don't have that money. You know, we're a small company. Why don't we uh, get, get you a literary agent, eek, and, <laughs> and, and go play that game? And so I got one. And mercifully, he's a really good guy who understood. He saw the book and said, I, got, I understand this. I got you. You're a nut, but I can get this book over the wall. And he did. And Chicago Review put the book out. And they're very good people. And, and so that's, the, that's why my logo is not on this book. It's basically monetary and promotion-wise. Uh, and it was Heidi, this woman who bosses me around, she's got the good idea. She said, do me a favor, let's not do it on this, on our company. I said, yeah, you're right. So. Um, I noticed in the writing um, that it was really, um, there's lots of different things going on. There's a lot of questions going on in the book. There's a lot of uh, illuminations going on in the book as well that are very sort of like hard won. But there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of commentary about the idea or the reality of fear being go coming going through all civilizations and how that sort of relates to the idea of war in our uh, in in man's nature. All very um, it's all very sort of. It's all dealt with um, in so many different ways in this writing that really sort of uh, kind of struck me. I mean, there's a lot of there's there's cynicism, there's futility, there's humor, and it's dark, but there's also this compassion and self-reflection in it. <clears throat> and it, so that melange really sort of struck me. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of show you a photograph, and I wanted to read one of these uh, pieces, if that's okay with you. Yeah, of course. Just just to sort of. Uh, just to share it with you. This is a photograph. Oh God, if I can hold this. I mean, I don't know if you guys have flicked through this. This is a photograph of this <laughs> this human being living on the street on his belly uh, in complete poverty and complete squalor, and as a, as a, a primarily begging for for existence and in, in anything he can get. There's a couple of photographs that go with this, and. Um, 
it's, it's completely striking and mesmerizing, and, and the, the fact that Henry sort of can come get down into a crouch and, and take this photograph um, is, m m must be completely painful, you know, uh, as, as human to human. It must be um, <clears throat> remarkable in, in, in seeing that kind of uh, degradation of, of life. Where is my upgrade? I am entitled to my upgrade. I checked the box on the coupon. Things are getting better. No, really, they are. No matter what happens, keep moving forward. Now I know that's easier said than done, but that's the job. I went into a restaurant once, and at the counter there was a paper plate on the wall that had a happy face on it and a bit of wisdom written on it that I read to myself. Don't sweat the small stuff. By the way, it's all the small stuff. My initial reaction was to leap over the counter and beat the hippie standing there senseless. <laughs> I wanted to see what he thought of the sound of his nose breaking as it was repeatedly smashed into the counter and if that could be relegated to small stuff status. <laughs> Instead of handing out this worthwhile life lesson, I politely ordered my food and waited for its preparation as I thought of his nose exploding and his blood spraying into the tabbouleh. <laughs> but seriously, folks, it's true. Things are getting better as long as you keep striving to make it better for yourself. Now, I am not trying to sound like I am running down the road of objectivism. Oh, no. I mean, everyone knows Ayn Rand was a cunt. <laughs> Even the... <laughs> Gotcha. Even the, <laughs> Even the cowards who still pathetically affix themselves to her pseudo-intellectual bullshit know that. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just saying, keep your chin up and keep on trucking, or crawling as the case may be, and as it gets better for you, it will get better for others. Of course, this really doesn't apply to the very wealthy because that would lend credence to all that trickle-down horseshit that obviously doesn't happen. While they make it better for themselves, they, well, you know the rest of that story. But as to the rest of us on the streets and roads of the real world, there is no small stuff. So, what are you going to do? Walk on by? Yeah, this book is, every page of this book, of all these photos, um, has, has this, this writing, and I was really struck by it. And, you know, Henry, I know Henry's a, a, a voracious uh, reader, and he, you know, when I first met him, he was, like, way into, like, investigating, like, Henry Miller, and I'm talking, like, 25 years ago, like, he was a young guy, and he was just like, boom, you know, it's just like, this is before there was any internet or anything, and he was like on the dial phone calling booksellers across America, like, what do you got? What do you got? And, you know, it's like buying Henry Miller books. And uh, that's the, that's one thing, I mean, Henry and I are completely different kinds of dudes, but that's one thing I really related to was that complete investigation into things that you think are um, personally important and that you can share with the world, and uh, we were talking about archiving earlier. Um, Henry has an, a, an amazing archive of music, and I guess, I guess music primarily. But I mean, I think you probably also um, have a lot of literature in your in your in your collection. And uh, I was telling him, it's like, yeah, you know, I've been doing that forever, and I, I everything is protected. But I always like to take the protection off of it because I sort of like the raw, like. You know the, the tangibility, the touch of the, of, of the books and the records. I like to primarily, you know, before I listen to a record, I like to I like to touch it, I like to look at it, I like to smell it, and then I like to listen to it. I kind of know what's going to be on the record, so I kind of, you know, that's the least surprising thing to me in a way. But what's what everything else about it is what I want. And Henry said, well, the only the idea of protecting this stuff is that it's going to move forward from you into the next generation. And that, that's, um, that's so, very, so very true. I noticed in this book, in the photographs, it's chronologic, it's seven years, um, and it moves through a lot of the Middle East. It moves through a lot of uh, these d disparate era areas outside of the USA, but it also comes to the USA. And you, you, um, 
you show in these photographs of the USA, I show them on a level that they're almost um, in the same equation as the rest of the world as far as like people living in the margins. And I thought that was really um, a, a, this, this great sort of uh, balancing act that you had there. I also noticed in the work um, how they progressively become more beautiful as compositions. Like you, you're getting your shit together as a photographer. And I'd like to sort of know more about your uh, your. You know, but I'd like to know more about that as you as you as a photographer. The thing that uh, you'll, if you look at the book, you'll notice the the, the quality of the photos get better because my gear got better uh, as I would get aggravated with the limitations of a certain camera. I got good enough to where I can't do that. Oh. I need a better camera, and I get photographed a lot. And so I have access to a lot of professional <coughs> photographers. I say, hey, I'm burnt out on this thing because I can't do this, and they say, well, here, here's a better camera, you know, it's cheap, try that. And I get worn out on that after about eight months, because again, you kind of hit the ceiling of its abilities. And cameras are relatively simple, most of you know. It's just a light box, basically. But sometimes you have a bit more room to move, you can switch out lenses. And so I started getting better camera gear. But the, the challenge for me was I could do it with words. I can have an experience and put the words on the page and bring it to you, and you might get a version of what I want you to get. But I couldn't do that with a camera. So what I was trying to do is get the emotion, get that moment that I was seeing to where I look at it later and go, that's what I was talking about, so I can show it to you, and you get moved the way, or in a way that it moved me. And that's where I t had to understand f-stop and all of that and really get into the mechanics of, of photo, you know, photography. So I took some lessons, because uh, I'm kind of simple in that way. I I'm not an in really an innovative person. Like, need to know? Get a lesson. So I bought some photo books, and there's a woman who's thanked in the book named Mora, and she's photographed me a lot. And I said, Mora, you, you, get, you, you teach people how to take photos? She goes, actually, I do it all the time. I said, hook me up for three hours. And she, uh, she, we bought me some big boy camera gear. And uh, I said, where are we going? She said, the train station. I said, why? She said, because everyone's moving. You're going to learn how to take pictures of moving humans. That's what you want to do, right? I went, yeah, I want to get better at that. Because I got a moment to get that photo, and then the situation changes. She said, all right, we're going to get you a wide lens. We're going to go down the train station, and we're going to learn about shadow, dark, light, you know, high noon, afternoon. Here we go. And so I started learning about film speed dialing in the f-stop, and I said, I can't figure out these three different sliding scales. And she said, you're going to get this so wired, you're, you're going to do it in your sleep. And, said, and I'm, I'm slow on things. I just don't know, I'm, not, I'm slow on the pickup. And within six weeks after she said that, I could walk up to anything I wanted and just start dialing in the settings without even looking at the camera. And through the, the book, you see I'm kind of getting more, the shots become more emotive, because that's what I was always going for, but I just didn't know the technology of it. And so. One thing that really helped me with being a better photographer is just hanging out all day on the streets of whatever country I'm in, usually eight hours a day, with a camera and a towel over my shoulder to keep the, the camera from getting sweated out. And I, would lit I literally travel on my own. I get up in the morning and I hit the streets. Sometimes I get in a cab and I'll say, give me five dollars that way. The guy goes, what do you mean? I go, like, that way for a long time. And he goes, well, what are you going to do today? Get back to the hotel. How? We'll see. And anything that happens to me will be the history of that day, and anyone I encounter, I can get a photo, and that'll be the day. And I do this, and it's taken me through slums and all kinds of situations, and uh, that's how I, that's why you'll see a, a progressive thing in this, in this book where I get closer up on people, because I'm not paparazzi-like, I don't like grab a photo and run away, I ask, can I take a photo of you? And in some cultures, like, yeah, you got some money? I'm like, yeah, I do. Like, like the, the man uh, you saw, uh, Thurston showed you the photo of the man in, in Thailand pushing his bowl. I took that photo because I thought the guy had an optimistic expression on his face. The guy has no legs. There's another shot in the book from overhead. His legs are gone. But he keeps pushing that bowl ahead. And I would get there, hang out with him, take some photos as people walked by. And he kind of looked at the bowl and looked at me. I said, nah, I, I'm going to hook you up. And I gave him a bunch of bot, the local currency there. And, and so I, becoming a better cameraman allowed me to get up closer. I use a wide lens because it captures a lot of action. But it forces me. You want to get a portrait with a wide lens? You've got to get this far from someone. You can't be sneaky. You've got to go like, hi. We're going to interact. And it's not confrontational. I'm not there to confront anyone, truly. It's, it's not interesting to me. But you have to engage. 
and you have to, you know, touch that person, shake the hand, like position them, like kind, of, or just go like, hey, I want to do this, and because it might not be that slow, it'd be quick. It's like you're in, you're out. But using a wide lens forces me to get within two or three feet of someone. And, and I was just, I just came out of Haiti a few days ago. I spent quite a bit of time in Haiti visiting ten cities and, and orphanages and. Bought a lot of soccer balls and a lot of soap for these 10 cities. It's what people there told me they want me to get them. And uh, took a lot of portrait photos of orphans and, and lots of people living in Port-au-Prince and in the north and in the, in the south uh, of Haiti. And uh, w really got into the, you know, the, a, a three-point whatever f-stop where you're looking at the pores in people's faces. And uh, that's what I, I try and do is get very, very up close and personal. And you see the kind of uh, progress of all of that in this book, uh, the earlier photos, lower res, kind of just getting a photograph as a steno pad so I can write about it later, and the rest of it becomes far more intimate. And uh, you have to be very polite in countries when you take photos, cultures are very different. In Senegal, uh, there's no photos from Senegal in this book, and it's too bad because it might be some of the most photogenic people I've ever seen in my life. Again, with the wretched Kipling, I've got five in, in, in a trunk in, in the back. But they're the, these magnificent tall, amazing people and you pull up a camera and either you get this or like don't you dare and I don't know what's up with that but I got no photos of anyone who wasn't pissed off and I had to go sorry click and one guy came over and went for the camera and I said come on because he's gonna throw me across the street I'm like can we just make a joke and I'll leave and he's like all right keep walking I said you got it and 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 so uh Making this book and doing photos the way I do forces me to deal with people and their cultures and their lives momentarily. Uh, sometimes I felt very rotten taking these photos in that I go into some slums and there's the Karel slum in, in uh, Bangladesh in this, it's a pretty intense slum. But I can see my hotel where I'm going to be living that night in air-conditioned mosquito-free comfort. I can see it from the slum. And I can see the slum from my window that night. And Bangladesh is very lit up, except for the slum, there's no electricity. So there's like this huge gaping maw of darkness, this, this great abyss that I've been hiking through for two solid days. And by day, I'm shaking hands, and you know, kids see me as some Pied Piper with a camera, they're following me around, yelling at me. You play Marco Polo, you, they say, hello! I say, hello, they think it's hilarious, they say, hello, you know, all day. Uh, and, but I'm a voyeur in that I get back onto an airplane, and I leave them to their lives. And so I go in and out of feeling kind of awful and, and kind of like I'm just some, some jerk, actually, you know, coming in to get a photo. Bye now. You know, good luck. Keep on believing. You know, <laughs> keep moving forward, as I said in the thing. But that's how I, I feel sometimes uh, where I feel like I'm some disingenuous idiot taking these people's photos. I, I find them to be much better people than myself. So I try and pay respect to them, and, and my respect is, is through this book, you know, because their lives are amazing, and they, they have dignity, and they are, should be afforded great respect and dignity, and because uh, they love their kids like you love yours, and they want litter, you know, uh, they want to be literate, they want sanity, clean water, and a day that does not kill them, uh, and again, way too long, sorry, there you go. <laughs> I don't know how much more time we got, I have another question or two that I'd like to sort of hit. Uh, yeah, you guys are right out there. We're not going to keep you that long yeah. because it's uncomfortable to stand. I yeah, um, you know, I noticed when I first noticed that you were sort of going deep into the world and looking at civilization beyond the confines of being in a rock and roll band and touring around the world, which is you know <clears throat> has its has its merits, and you know, but I I, um, I first heard about it years back and I had seen that you were doing some USO stuff and that really sort of made me pause because I wasn't I didn't know what you were up to I mean I knew you were out there doing you know you're like you work all day you work every day you're you know Black Flag I think Henry always said like we're the hardest playing band out there you know it's like this this idea of just like you have this opportunity from where you come from and you take opportunity and if you're in a band and you can play every day you play every day because when you're not playing you're paying as Mike Watt would say so that was kind of you know that's that was sort of where we came from generationally you know I sort of had I came you know I came from the same kind of like you know middle class family you know it was just, my father was a school teacher so it was just like you know it was like you go out and you start getting being able to sort of make some coin by doing something you love, you do it. And so 
I sort of lost track of what Henry was doing. I knew he was out there with like his band and whatever was going on, but then I saw he was on a USO tour after losing track of him a little bit. And that really made me pause. And I was like, what is going on? Like, that is amazing that he would actually go there and want to sort of like, you know, see what was going on uh, first person, you know, as, as, as a creative person and as somebody who is definitely interested in the psychology of war and the so-called warrior and the war. And I wanted to ask you more about your experience with soldiers, with like being there, with your own sort of uh, personal take on military, because I know that's sort of something that is in your in your world to some degree, uh, in, in, in your history, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Sure. Like I said before, I said yes to the USO when they called me many years ago because I thought it would be a great anti-war statement. Because like I, I have no problem with soldiers. It's those who send them into conflict that I got a huge problem with. And so at one point the USO contacted me and they said, you know, who we are? I said, sure, Bob Hope, right? They said, yeah, same organization. You want to do a USO tour? I said, sure, why? And they said, well, we go to many bases. We put up a sign-up sheet. Who would you love to have materialize here tomorrow? And your name keeps popping up. We don't know who you are, but soldiers love you. <laughs> and, and I said, okay, uh, wh when do we go? When, when do you have some time? Well, I'm free here. Okay, great. And one thing led to another, and I'm on an airplane from America to Turkey to Kyrgyzstan to Afghanistan and back to America. And that started many, many tours with the USO, a first ever USO performer in Egypt. Uh, they said, we've never done a tour into Egypt before, but we want to do that. I said, that would be me. Let me do that. And they, they said, okay. So basically, I would go into places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, uh, Honduras, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Bahrain, uh, Djibouti, Japan, South Korea, Okinawa, etc., and then at least four more that I've forgotten, Qatar. And so I would go, and in, in, especially when it's hot, like in Baghdad or Afghanistan, it's a very apolitical situation that you're in, because it, it no longer matters who you voted for or what your take on this war is. Your job is to leave the gate every day and go for 12 to 15 hours and not get blown up, and get back to the DFAC, the dining facility, at sundown with all of your digits intact and all of your friends still alive. So what you think about the war, it's too late for your opinion, because today is don't get killed day. And so I found myself in a very apolitical environment, me being to the left of most things besides maybe my mom and Joan Baez. Um, I had a lot I wanted to say, but I saw quickly that this was not the place for it, because it's too late now. They're there. And I'll never forget being in, at the Bagram Air Base outside of Kabul, watching CNN with, with soldiers, and looking at CNN, looking at smoke coming up from something in Afghanistan, looking out the window and seeing the smoke. Like, wow, I am in the show. There it is. And watching soldiers watch the TV and listen to the man and just kind of laugh because their reality is, is much, much different. So I met a lot of infantry, I met a lot of Special Forces, Marines, Navy, Air Force, and went bases all over the world. And, I, and like I said, I got a lot of heat for it. Like, you know, you're pro-war. No, no, I, I, I'm a custodian. You know, George W. Bush started a fake war. I'm sweeping up behind him. I'm, I'm, help, I'm making people laugh. I go on these huge stages and kind of BS with hundreds of, of soldiers at a time, sit and talk with them, and then follow up in America by taking days and going to Walter Reed and going room after room and seeing people horribly mutilated permanently. And it's a more, a more depressing environment. I, it's hard, you, I'd be hard pressed to find. And so that was my experience with soldiers. I met really cool, switched on young people who took on this I insane job. And they're out there doing it. And a lot of them would say to me, look, I didn't sign on for this, and, but here I am. Thank you for speaking out about it, because I know what you do when you're not here. And I actually got into it with a few commanding officers. I was talking to a group of young men in Kyrgyzstan. And I said, uh, folks, I'd never lie to you. That's the vice president's job. And nervous yeah. laughter through the crowd. <laughs> and the upper echelon men looked at me like, you know, I'm a hot potato, pal. It's, it's, it's too late to drop me. I'm in your lap. And, and to this day, people say, did you say the, the vice president was a liar? I said, yeah, I, I kind of did that. In the right place. Like, brought the truth to power as best I could. So that was kind of, that's, that's my, my multi-year history with the military. It was an anti-war 
sentiment I was trying to bring. And you'll find a lot of comedian types are out at the hospitals in the middle of nowhere, like Jeff Ross, who's brutal, and uh, don't want to get on the wrong side of him. But he's out there all the time. And I've done hospital visits with you know, like Shaquille and O'Neal and, and, you know, pro sports people like John Elway and, and, and all of that. And, and, and so a lot of comedians, because they just want to make somebody laugh. And I go in there and try and crack them up as best as you can crack up a guy with no legs who's looking at the rest of his life legless. And that's, that, was, that was my attempt. And there's some photos of that. You see the highway of death in here. Uh, I had the dubious uh, dishonor of spending the night in Ude Hussein's old bedroom uh, with the hooks in the ceiling where he could winch the women up. And I slept in his bed and uh, just listened to intermittent gunfire all night long outside in the green zone. So uh, I had the same, the same son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, 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 Uday had a party house uh, uh, that the U.S. military took over. Did you see that movie that they brought Uday that they, that just came out? No, no, I, anything with it. I I don't know if I could sit through. <laughs> yeah, he's a disturbing guy, but he had a party house where he'd take his women and have his fun. They have turned it into a place where an American service person can have leave but not have to go home. They give you beer, lots of DVDs. And they put me and some USO people up there one night, and someone said, you, what if you have dubious dishonor going and spend the night in, you know, Uday Hussein's bed, and boom, I went right up the stairs, because it's got to be me. And I used the master bedroom, it was quite obvious, and I went in, and, and someone followed me, and, see those hooks in the walls, and that's where he hoisted up his women. And that could be true, I, maybe it was where his potted plants used to swim. In. <laughs> but those tours afforded me going through uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, palaces, uh, looking at his gold bidets, and his awful taste in interior design. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, a, a, a worse monster you'd be hard pressed to find. But it was, those trips were extremely surreal because you do all of it on jet lag. You land at like 4.30 in the morning and someone slaps an itinerary in your face at oh, 0500, you're having breakfast with the troops. And then we're going, you're like, can I get some sleep? Tomorrow, and off you go. And you just kind of do the thing with toothpicks holding your eyes open. Flying around on, on uh, Black Hawk uh, uh, choppers definitely gives you all the adrenaline you need for the rest of the day. But that I, I have become, I think, too hot a potato for the USO. I don't, they don't call me anymore. <laughs> I think I, I flap my mouth too often, and I kind of. Uh, they're very cryptic, the USO. Not a bad organization, but it, their their motto is "Until everyone comes home." Duh, duh, duh. <laughs> because they will all come home. It just depends on if they're standing and walking, or if they're injured, or if they're in a, some container coming back to be buried. And, and so they will all come home, and so the USO, when it does end, it'll be, the end of the USO means peace and the 24-7 P-Funk Ramones block party. Um, so uh, that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know, and then you go out on your own accord and, and, go, in, and go in deep. And not to sound uh, slight or pithy, but how how do you keep your health? I mean, I know that you, you that must be like hard to like eat in a way where you're going to stay uh, not I sick. I mean, do you get sick? Yeah. Let's hear some sick shit. <laughs> places, uh, the first thing you do is you go out and find water. You find one place where you can get water and you, you, you open the water bottle in front of the guy to listen for the clicks. And in a lot of countries, like in Africa, uh, they, they put a government sticker over the water uh, top, just like a bottle of alcohol. And so you find the one guy's got good water and you, you buy a lot because water, you're going to need it. I have found myself bringing mostly my own food to places, and uh, I dragged enough food for eight or nine days. I did the Trans-Siberian Express a few years ago. That was eight days, seven days alone in a train. I even brought all my own water from Trader Joe's, from LAX to Heathrow, all the way to Moscow, on my back. And I used all of it. And uh, quite often in African countries or parts of Southeast Asia or India or Bangladesh, I will go for the cliff bar rather than roll the dice on the local chow. Not putting down the local fare, but I have had that go sideways on me. I have projectile vomited in Burma. I have watched my puke hit the window in the middle of Siberia. I have gone cross-eyed nauseous in Russia, uh, in, in Moscow, from stupidly drinking water for a second. Uh, and so now I bring a lot of my own food. The Cliff Bar, maybe not appetizing sitting here right now, but after 12 hours, it's like, ooh, I love you, Cliff Bar. <laughs> and I also bring my own tea. Coffee tends to perish on the road. The tea, you know, hangs in there. So I bring lots of PG tips and Ziploc bags. And so uh, I cast off ballast as I go. But I, as I travel through some of these places quite often, I know where good places are in certain countries where I can get good peanuts and good this or that. 
Like in, in Kathmandu, there's one place I buy my peanuts from. This guy's got great peanuts. I, and, and I've seen him a few times. And I go, oh, you're the crazy guy who buys the peanuts from me. And, and so I, I will reload in some countries where I can get good provisions. And uh, so the backpack is always burdensome because it's full of foodstuffs. So a lot of times I chicken out and I eat my own stuff. I learned that pro first time in Madagascar where the food I ate was stuff I stole out of the dressing room of Black Sabbath. So I was hanging out with them and then I went to Africa. So I was walking the streets in Madagascar going, I can't eat that, I get too many flies. What is that moving thing? It's a meat object and just kind of hit the thing, the flies come off, they saw a piece off and they cook it for you. Like, what is it? It's meat. What animal? It's meat. And, and I said, you know, I was using the peanuts that I stole from Ozzy Osbourne, actually. And that's when I said, I'm going to start bringing my own food. And that's how I avoid rolling the dice. Because I want to be up on my feet all day, not in the bed going, oh, I want to die. And all of you have gotten food sick. It's, it's brutal. And so that's, that's why I, I bring this food everywhere. And I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be like the, 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 the cowardly traveler where they just like never leave their element by bringing it all with them. But man, you've got to have some protein when you need it. And if it's looking dodgy in town, you have to have an option. And then there it is. We, we should probably... Let's stop it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to stop and do some signing. You can, uh, you can ask uh, your questions. Thanks for showing up. Thank you very much.